Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about liberalism, Marxism, constructivism, and feminism. Last time we talked about realism, which is the dominant theory, and so we focused extensively on it. This time we're going to share the time with all these theories. Liberalism. You could write it down here. Liberalism, Marxism, constructivism, feminism. You could put a stop freeze and easily write down all these things. Now, liberalism. Who are the philosophers? Remember, realism had Thucydides, Hobbes, Machiavelli. These are ancient classical ones. And the, and the modern ones are like Kissinger and Cannon. Remember that? Now, of course, also Margantha. Now, for liberalism, we have in antiquity classical thinkers. One of the big ones are Thomas Aquinas. You know how to spell Thomas, but Aquinas is A Q U I N A S. Thomas Aquinas. And Grotius, Hugo, Hugo Grotius. All these are great thinkers of liberalism. And Hugo Grotius is considered the father of international law. Okay? Thomas Aquinas, Hugo Grotius, and an iconic figure of liberalism is Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, you know how to spell Immanuel, and Kant here, Kant, Immanuel Kant. We'll be talking a, a more detail about Immanuel Kant. Of course, if I have to say modern thinkers, just like Henry Kissinger, Marganta for realism, modern will be Woodrow Wilson for liberalism. Okay, so what do they say? How did this theory differ from? Realism, which is all about selfish nature, human nature, international relations, doesn't have an international government, there is no higher authority, you're on your own, um, power, struggle for power, all this looks very dark, right? Liberalism is very different. And let me start with Kant, Kant's idea, Immanuel Kant's idea. He wrote a book called Perpetual Peace, and I have given you the link. You could look up the link and we're going to discuss just five points from that link, that book. The link has the book, okay? And what are the five points when he, what, what we are going to talk about? I'll explain. I'll read the first line and then I'll explain. Kant, unquote, no treaty of peace shall be held valid in which there is tacitly reserved matter for a future war. What do you say? He's saying a treaty. What is a treaty? A treaty is an agreement between two countries. Okay, you and I make a treaty, that's not a treaty, it's a contract. Treaties are made between countries, right? States in international relations. And when treaties are made between states, he says the, sh the treaty shouldn't have seeds of future war. I'll give you an example, then you will understand this better. The Versailles Treaty, signed after World War I. And the victors, the ones who won the war, England, France, and the loser, Germany, was made to pay enormous amount of money, indemnification, penalties basically, for starting the war and causing the casualties. So, the Germans signed it because they lost and they were forced to sign and they did not like it, the people. And guess what happened? That actually helped Hitler come to power in Germany. And then what? World War II. So, Woodrow Wilson, who studied Kant, he was a professor. Woodrow Wilson was a modern liberalism icon. He studied Immanuel Kant, he was a professor of political science in, at Princeton University, even now if you go, well nah, right now they removed the name I think, uh, we don't want to go into the details of this modern politics why they removed, but we'll focus on Woodrow Wilson, when he was a professor there, 
and later went on to become governor of New Jersey and president of the United States and he was there during World War I and he did not like the terms of the treaty which France and England is making Germany sign because he believed Kant is right that if you sow the seeds of future war the treaty shouldn't be valid and that's exactly what happened when you force somebody when you force Kant states to sign something which they completely don't want they were forced in a place they don't have an option okay treaty peace treaties should be nullifying future war that should be the goal Kant is genius Kant let me give you a couple of points Kant is did not have if you have to do a psychological analysis he lived in a peaceful time 18th century okay and almost in the beginning of the 19th century he died Kant unlike Thucydides Thomas Hobbes Machiavelli didn't go through tough life he was a professor in Germany Konigsberg and some would say like he had a comfortable life his mother washing the shocks he will take walks and read books never left the place where he lived but he was very good with international relations and let's see his second point Khan second point no independent states large or small shall come under the dominion of another state by inheritance exchange purchase or donation basically what he is saying is you cannot so I have say this time I could give it to anybody as a gift or uh, my family members could inherit this time after I am gone right whereas Kant is saying you cannot do that with states it's not an object at the time in Europe you could uh, when, a, when a princess gets married they will give a, 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 a gift a part of the uh, kingdom or state because there are people involved in it it's not an object you cannot just give it as a gift or inheritance exchange purchase or donation okay but for Kant people are vital because he said people shouldn't be used write it down people shouldn't be used as a means to an end because people are the end you cannot use people as a means to any end okay so the third point is Kant said standing armies shall in time be totally abolished what does that mean that means Kant doesn't want standing armies if Kant remember the title of the book of Kant perpetual peace all this is to achieve peace okay no treaty shall shouldn't have seats of future war he is trying to achieve peace in the world perpetual peace that's a daunting task peace is very frail you ask a realist they would say oh there will always be war you ought to be prepared for war in order to achieve peace but Immanuel Kant says every country should abolish standing armies what is standing armies standing armies is a trained military force ready to go and strike any time and he says that's bad because the leader will start a war right imagine if you have a hammer have you heard of the saying Mark Twain said for a man with a hammer everything looks like a nail <laughs> every problem you will try to use your hammer so Kant is saying standing armies should be abolished that's why in America during the founding fathers time they did not want they, they, they read Kant they did not want standing army and then you say well wait a minute American Revolution we fought with the army against the British but yeah that was American citizens not, they're not trained military soldiers Washington gathered militia people who were farmers and all kinds of workmen iron smith and all came and fought for the revolution so this is not like a trained military officers in payroll well now it has changed well the counter argument some people say is 
how many of civilians will know to fly a fighter jet, F-16 fighter jet, or um, a battle cruiser, anything, or a submarine. You have to train, keep them ready. More realism, right? But Kant's idea of, of standing army shall be abolished. Some countries did. Some countries did. Okay? Like uh, countries of, of uh, Costa Rica doesn't have army. Uh, Switzerland, the, the people volunteer. So Kant is not saying you shouldn't fight. You could ask, just like in American Revolutions, the soldiers who, the, the citizens who are interested to defend their country could come together and fight a war. Okay? The fourth point, national debt shall not be con con contracted with a view to the external friction of states. Basically, don't borrow money to fight wars. That's like putting it in credit card to fight a war. Okay? Kant doesn't like the idea of debt incurring for war, which is exactly what we do now. What do we do? We borrow money for the Iraq war, the 20th, 21st century Bush era. We piled a lot of money. Chinese paid for it. Any other wars. Even Afghanistan war. We go into debt. Okay? Which is not good for a country. And the fifth one, last one, no state shall be, no state shall by force interfere with the constitution or government of another state. Basically, in one word, sovereignty. Sovereignty means, write it down if you don't know the word. Yes, S O V E E R E I G N T Y. Sovereignty. Okay? This means each state has the right to make their decision within their boundaries. So Germany could decide, or let's say, leave Germany because you might think of what we discussed just now of war. Say India. It's a state. No other country has the right to come and say, oh, what type of education system you have, you should change it to have this. Or if they want to have a, a completely different type of marriage institution or different type of voting, other countries doesn't have the right to tell them and what type of constitution they should have or not. Some countries don't even have constitution. It is sovereignty. People within that boundaries, they could elect a government whichever they fit choose to do. I mean, some countries have parliamentarian system. Some countries have presidential system like ours, right? And some countries have bicameral. That means what? Two houses, Senate and the House, like we have. Some countries have unicameral, like China. Unicameral, which is one chamber. So they could decide. They have the authority to do. And others should not intervene in internal affairs of another country, is what Kant is saying. Because it's asking for, the goal is what? Peace. Kant's goal is peace making. Okay? Now, these five points, you could read the entire book of Perpetual Peace if you're interested. I want to discuss further about Kant, how he wants to achieve peace. Let's see. Draw a triangle. We're going to call it a Kantian triangle. Kantian triangle. Okay? And put a P in the middle. And that means peace for Kant, the Kantian triangle, peace, okay, write one word, institutions, in one side, like this, we're going to write all three sides, here, here, so democracy, one side, I'll explain, don't worry, democracy, civil so global civil society, global civil society, global civil society so and can't and put iron mark one feet on the other so Kant is saying to achieve peace we need to have countries should have democracy basically he republicanism republicanism 
democracy. What does democracy mean? Some of you might not have had a, a political science class at all. Democracy, demo means people, krasi rule, Greek origins. Kant is talking about the Republican form of democracy. Republican democracy in that what's the difference? This is like indirectly elected um, people elect officials like the United States is a republic. Right? We have elected officials who make decisions on our behalf. We don't decide whether to go to war or not. Congress votes. They decide on our behalf. Right? So Republican values with Republican values, liberty. Okay, uh, they, The democracies, the key idea is write it down at the bottom. DPT. DPT. Democratic Peace Theory it's called. It's Kant's, Kant's idea and what does it mean? The, the theory is, democratic peace theory is, democracies don't go to war with each other. Really? Yeah. Look around in history and Kant is brilliant based on what he said. Even now, okay, do you think we will fight Canada? Or do you think we will fight England right now? No, we, we don't see the chances of war. But we might have a war with China or Russia, correct? Do you think they are democracies? We, we won't even, it's not just Western countries. Do you think we will fight a war with India? It's a, it's a democracy. Whereas, look at the wars we fought in Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, okay, the recent wars. They are not democracies. Democracies have common values. And guess what? They also have common values of political values and also they trade with each other. They do not go to war. Even if you go back to World War II, the United States fought war against, correct, Germany and Japan. They were democracies? No, Hitler was dictator. And Japan, military, took over completely, right? Yes, Trojo was prime minister. The monarch, the, the, the emperor of Japan had complete control. It's not a clear democracy, especially women didn't have franchise, voting power. After America defeated and took over Japan, it gave women rights to vote. And now Japan is a functioning democracy and we won't have a chance of fighting them. We might fight North Korea and that's a, not a democracy. You understand Kant's idea, democratic peace theory. So countries should become more democratic and more democracies in the world, more chance of peace, less chance of war. You see the idea, idea of liberalism? <clears throat> it's a different way of seeing the world, it's finding common ground and building peace. So it's, it's not just saying de uh, uh, democracy alone. He's also talking about what? Institutions. When he says institutions, what is it? He's not talking about marriage as an institution. He's talking about large international institutions. Like, for example, the United Nations. Where did you think that idea of United Nations came from? Have you ever thought about it? The United Nations started right after World War II, right? FDR's idea. But FDR got its idea where? Liberal FDR. That is a Kant's idea. He didn't write it as United Nations. He wrote League of Nations. League of Nations. In fact, right after World War One, they created a League of Nations which failed and then that evolved further into into United Nations. League of Nations was Woodrow Wilson's idea, which he got it from Kant. Countries coming together, so international organizations is like the UN is an organization, it's an institution. Okay? People institution, you are in an educational institution. You are Working in a corporate environment, that is an institution, financial institution or whatever institution you work has rules and the rules make you bind the actors. Whoever is involved in the institution are bound by the rules of the institution. It's like stickiness factor. You will get stuck. You won't be able to act as however you want. Your behavior changes based on the <coughs> institution and rules. You doubt me? In soccer, if you're a player or anything, or basketball, you could be rough. Rough means 
within the rules, you could shoulder somebody while you're trying to take the ball. Would you do that in the class if you're debating? No. That's violence in the class. In the ground, you contact is fine because that's within the rules. Not in a classroom, the institution rules changes. So United Nations have different rules and the rules are written in a fashion to bring peace. Different actors, rival actors, coming to table to build, build peace. The goal of the United Nations is what? To bring peace. That's why. International institutions. So can't DPT, democracies, peace is built also on the institution. Another one, third one is what? Global civil society. Now, what is civil society? <clears throat> Before we talk about global civil society. Civil societies are any organizations which is beyond the realm, R-E-A-L-M, realm of government. I'll give you an example, then you will understand better. For example, Boy Scout. Do you think United States state government or uh, federal government or city government controls? No. Religious institutions, people go worship in a church, mosque. This is not controlled by the government. Okay? Environmental movements. Are you following? And all these are civil society. Actors coming together. Actors means individuals like you and me. Coming together, working towards a common goal. But it's not politics. State or federal politics or local politics. No. In fact, if you go back to 19th century, a French man named Tocqueville, Alexis D. Tocqueville, came to America and observed and wrote a book, Democracy in America, and he said the democracy flourishes in America. Many reasons for one of them is civil society, a strong civil society we have. It's, it's depleting. That's a different argument. Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone. I don't want to go into that uh, because then it'll be like teaching American government. In international relations, global civil society so internationally you have civil societies of people coming together so for american red cross it goes across um, haiti has a as a disaster natural disaster they go in there and people from israel go in there to haiti to help each other india had a tsunami uh, countries from all over the world send help to reach and help. Are you following? So the civil societies, all this interconnected, create Kantian triangle of peace. Okay? So now you understand how Kant's idea of liberalism. Liberalism also believe in the idea of peace through trade. Write it down. Peace through trade because trade creates a mutual interdependency interdependency because you make money I make money you know what a trade is right if you, if you don't have an idea of trade say if the glasses are made in India the tie is made in America you trade you send goods and through through trade countries economies improve and so when your economy improves and your wealth improves you don't want to screw that up by going to war so it builds peace and Kant's idea of trade and liberalism is correct. It's not necessarily, realists would argue, you know, though I, I'm teaching liberalism here and there, I bring a realist argument to show you. Realists would say, well, Europe, right at the edge of, uh, before the World War I started, there's an author named Norman Angel wrote a book, okay, uh, that war is not possible in Europe because they, they are very mutually interdependent with um, trade, strong trade between them. Economic interests will not prevent war. Well, then they, he was given a Nobel Prize, and then, then war came. Mm -hmm. So, let's talk about, after liberalism, Marxism. When I say Marxism, what comes to your mind? Yeah, Karl Marx. Karl Marx created the idea, German, um, and a philosopher. He was lived in poverty most of his life and wrote these books, Das Capital, you know that, right? The Capital. And Karl Marx's idea of, what is the idea? Main, main one, if I have to say, 
the bujuaji, which is the moneyed class. You, you heard a few people saying buji. <laughs> it's come from bujuaji. Uh, well, if I had to spell it, B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S-E, -E, bujuaji. The moneyed class exploits the proletariat, P-R-O-L-E-T-A-R-I-A-T, proletariat. Bourgeoisie exploits the proletariat. Proletariat is the working class. And the bourgeoisie get rich based on proletariat's work. Capitalism, Marxism is attacking capitalism, the idea of capitalism. In capitalist society, the Amazon Jeff Bezos, for example, is a capitalist. Warren Buffett is a capitalist. They put money and they built enormous money like billions of dollars and some people like Marxist ideology would say like well look that the employees hard work is what he is getting the money he's getting building his wealth based on he's not paying them properly he's not giving them enough all this and here for international relations countries some countries are like bourgeoisie and some countries are like the proletariat and the bourgeoisie countries exploit the proletariat. Okay? And they get rich by exploiting the poor countries. So there's a, there's a, this idea of Marx was to totally achieve equality. The end goal is equality. And the proletariat will overthrow the bourgeoisie. Okay, and it happened in reality the first time in Russia, in Russian Revolution. Lenin, after him Stalin, Lenin, who came to power, wrote the book of uh, imperialism. Imperialism, and he called the Americans and the British as imperialist, the capitalistic societies. Okay, his way of seeing the world, international relations is these countries exploit poor countries and that's how they get rich okay and so let me talk about write down this structure structure theory of imperialism imperialism i m p e r i a l i s m imperialism structural theory of imperialism it was by johan j o h a n Galtung, I might not pronounce his name right. Well, English itself is my second language. Galtung, G A L T U N G. And this, this Galtung, G A L T U N G. Structural theory of imperialism, what does it say? Say, for example, the core, core countries, say United States, core, C O R E, these countries exploit the periphery. Periphery means at the end, right? P E R I P H E R Y, periphery, countries in the periphery. So Caribbean, for example, is periphery. Jamaica, for example, and the United States exploits these countries according to Marxist idea, and they get rich. They exploit for what? Exploit for raw materials and labor, and they do not want these poor countries to get rich. That's Marx's way of seeing the world. And another, another uh, man, scholar, Emmanuel, just like Emmanuel Kant's first name, Emmanuel Wallerstein. Wallerstein is spelled W-A-L-L-E-R-S-T-E-I-N. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Wallerstein also extended the theory. He had core, periphery, and semi-periphery semi-periphery and in semi-periphery what is the difference these are middle level countries core top periphery bottom so middle level countries where these core countries will invest money to make money uh, so example of a semi-periphery country will be like chile okay and through exploitation these countries get rich and that's how Marxists see international relations. 
Now let's move to constructivism. You already have the spelling. What is constructivism? Constructivism is a theory that, have you heard of Margaret Mead? She's, she's in Columbia University. Margaret Mead, anthropologist. If you go to uh, the Museum um, of History and Natural History, Museum of Natural History, she has presence there. She's gone, but her works and other things. She's a cultural anthropologist, got her PhD from Columbia, and did a lot of work uh, on studying different cultures. And she came up with the idea that, for example, war is a social construct. That means war is created by mankind. What does that mean is, if war is created by mankind, it could be uncreated or descendant inventor, if that is the word. Because it's not like uh, realists believe that war is in human nature. She believes that war is a social invention. And uh, in constructivists, they, they have um, norms, norms, okay? Norms means like rules, how, how rules are observed and behaved. So let me give you an example of, uh, of the constructivists have culture. Each country has a culture, okay, and identity. And identity. Write it down. I will explain to you. Identity. So, what what do you mean identity? Like I have an identity as a male, okay, and um, uh, American is an identity. New Yorker is an identity like that uh, and we have identities for countries we will call some countries or oh, friendly countries some countries as or oh, their enemies North Korea to the United States is an enemy right because they have threatened it many times to nuke us what do you think that is friendly country so United States with the UK what do you think that relationship is friendly we are allies friends. We fought World War One, World War Two together and even for Iraq war and others we supplied they supplied troops with us and so very friendly relationship. So culture, I come to culture, Hobbesian. You know what a culture is, right? And of course this cultural anthropologist created the word itself. <laughs> anthropologist. If I'm not wrong, Ruth Benedict created friend of Margaret Mead created the word, coined the word culture. Now everybody throws the word around. Culture. And in, in, in culture makes certain behaviors. Right? So if you're from a particular culture, you might have, like Indian culture, I come from, we eat with fingers, not spoons. Wash our hand and eat with hand. That's our culture. In Western world, my culture changed after I come here, I eat with spoon and fork. So the culture determines your behavior. Okay, so constructivists, where are they going with this uh, uh, culture and identity? I'll tell you. They are saying the relationship changes between countries over time. It's not fixed. So, for example, you take U.S. and U.K. Okay, write it down, U.S. and U.K. What do you call that relationship? Now, I would call that relationship Kantian, Kantian culture, because Kantian culture is what? It's trade, very friendly, Immanuel Kant, Kantian, K-A-N-T-I-A-N, Kantian culture. But identity what? Friend, friend, friend. Now, <laughs> go back to American Revolution time. You think American, the United States, when they came together during George Washington time, it's a friend? No. It was a different. But it changed now. Correct? Now what about US now with uh, with the China? Is it friend? No. But it's not enemy either. So what would you call? It? It's a rival. So the identity is a rival. They compete. They compete strongly, they compete. And that would be called the the, the culture would be called Lockean. Lock. 
Yes, John Locke. L O C K E A N. Lockean culture. Identity is rivals. And US and North Korea, enemy is the identity. Culture is Hobbesian. Thomas Hobbes. You see the world as dog eat dog work. But guess what? The constructivists say it's all creation, it changes, just like I gave you the example of US during the Revolutionary War. North Korea relationship with us might change. For example, with Iran, now we are enemies, whereas you go back, go back means just 50, and before 1979, Iran and the US have strong, good relationship. The, the ruler, Pahlavi, and American presidents were close. After 1979 revolution, we don't even have an embassy there because they took a hostages of American embassy workers. So the point is, you got it. Constructivists believe everything is invented, created. It could be, it's not like, they don't see it like human nature is dark, selfish, and short, brutish, nasty, all this. It evolves. Are you following? Yeah. Okay. Now, what about feminism? I'm going to discuss this and I'm going to go into a table. So, the table will help you differentiate between each of these theories and you will understand better. But let me give you a couple of words at least of feminism. Feminism, as you know, is the international relations is dominated by men. Yes, men. You go to the UN, you will see 90% or above are men, especially people in power. Secretary General, the top guy who is always a man. I mean, never have been a woman. It's a, it's a man in international relations. The men are the mostly ambassadors, okay? And women, very small in number. And feminism sees that women play roles differently. Same role given to women, they play differently. In fact, research shows they actually, when they make peace, those peace last longer. Yes, women, you all should raise your collar. And that is what you would do. I don't know. Men do that. So I don't want to find that you need to do a man's behavior. And you have to understand that the feminism is a theory that believes more women leaders in international relations will bring more peace. Let's let's look at the table and let's talk. Draw a table. This is I'm showing you a notebook. I took notes when ten years ago my professor taught me realism, liberalism, Marxism, constructivism, feminism. Write down this. Draw the lines. And here, one, two, three, four, like that. Key actors, I'm going to say these things. And then against realism, liberalism, I'm going to read. So you draw a table like that. We're going to have like eight, ten points. So we'll go to next page as well. So key actor in the far left, first column, you right. Under realism, key actors, who's the key actor in realism? States. States are the key actors. That's it no one else. In realism, only actors are states. Whereas if you go to liberal, liberalism, international organization could be uh, an actor. Wait, don't write. And you and I could be, you and I could create peace. Um, Greta Thunberg could be a peacemaker, climate activist. She comments on international affairs right and uh, anyone small or large organization or and states all are actors in for liberalism so the word is everybody everybody what about marxism who are the actors marxism it is the economic classes economic classes rich poor economic classes what about constructivism key actors state regimes regime regime means the software 
of a computer, if I have to give an analogy. State is the hardware. Regime is the software. The U.S. software is the constitution. It's a democratic institution. That's the software. So regimes, state regimes, regimes change. Iraq was an enemy. We fought war with Saddam Hussein. Overthrew him. The regime changed. We did. And now we have a democratically elected Iraqi parliament. We ha don't have the enemy relationship, as constructivists would say. So the main players are state regimes. Okay? Feminists, individuals, individuals are the actors in feminism. Women, individuals. Key issue, key issue for Okay, write down the far left corner, key issues. Let's talk about realist security. Key issue for, it's always about security. Okay. Liberalism, everything, climate change, human rights, all this are, everything is a key issue. Environmental pollution and uh, uh, you name it, modern day slavery, sexual slavery, all this are an issue for liberalism. They care. But for realists, that's all not involved in international politics. It's all about security of a state. A yeah, very serious business. Marxism, the key issue is economics. Money. It's all about exploitation, right? Money. Constructivists, the, the, the chief issue is peace. Peace. For women, okay? For women, feminism, betterment, betterment, are raising awareness of women's role in issues. Third one, context, far left, context, far left column, context if you write, you understanding what I'm saying? Far left means always here, then now it's read this, okay. Anarchic system, anarchic system. For realism because what is anarchy there's no higher authority government if there's no government in the united states it's what we call an anarchy right international relations is an anarchy according to realism so what context this whole thing happens anarchic system and for liberalism it happens in a global civil society or international community Marxism, it all happens in capitalistic global economy. And for constructivists, cultures of anarchy. It happens in cultures of anarchy. Okay? And for feminism, what do you think? You got it. It's a male-dominated state system. Male-dominated state system. The context is. Fourth one. Key dynamic. Key dynamic. Far left, you write key dynamic. It's realism. Conflicting, it's conflicting. Conflict is the thing. Key dynamic is the dynamics between actors. The states are the actors, so it's on conflict always. Liberalism, cooperation. The key dynamics is what? Cooperation. Marxism, exploitation. And constructivism, evolution. Things change, remember? UK and US relationship in 18th century versus now. Evolve, things evolve, progression, key dynamic, it's evolution. For for feminism, well, feminism, it is differentiation. Okay? Differentiating between the genders. Key dynamic. Fifth one, key concepts. What are the key concepts? There are so many in each other. I want to name a few. Write it down. Key concepts under realism is self-help. Okay? Self-help. Remember this? And geopolitics. You know it. Human nature. Prudence. <laughs> Machiavelli's word. All these are key concepts. In liberalism, key concepts is democracy, collective, security, multilateral, multilateralism. Okay? That means many countries coming together and doing 
something multilateral rather than unilaterally doing multilateral. In Marxism, the key concept is imperialism, monopoly, cooperation. You all know that what monopoly is. Corporations also you know. Key concepts under constructivism is identity, culture, right? Okay. And key concepts in feminism, what do you think? Subjugation, subjugating women, gender, man versus woman. Okay. Now let's talk about the sixth point. Sixth point, power on the far left. Power. What kind of power? Realism. Hard power. It's all about military might. Even money is hard power, by the way. It's not soft power. Hard power. Whereas liberalism has both hard and soft. It's not that it doesn't believe in military, but it believes in other stuff. Soft power. Okay? Like soft power is what? You know, if I got to give you an example, United States, the hard power is military, it's economic might, right? You saw all that, the geography. The soft power is its culture, okay, of politics, like democracy. So it's not like a dictatorship. The United States idea is exported around the world. When the United States created this, other countries were not such a large democracy, the oldest democracy. And now it's spread. Most of the countries in the world currently are democratic. And so there will be less war. You got it, like Kantian thinking. So both hard and soft. What about for Marxist? It's all about money. <laughs> it's the money is the problem, right? The exploitation by the rich countries, with the poor countries. So it's hard power. Constructivism, it's soft power. Okay? Feminism, it's both hard and soft. Depending on which type of feminism, there are different types of feminism. We don't want to go into detail. If you go to graduate level, you will learn that. And game theory, seven, great game theory. Zero sum for realism. Zero sum means what? Game theory. Okay. It's a, uh, all the, game theory is a mathematical um, game they would create to identify win, lose, and prisoner's dilemma. There's different games. But let's let's focus on here. In realism, zero sum. Write it down. I'll explain. Zero sum. That means you win, I lose. I win, you lose. They see it black and white. There's no gray area. Whereas in liberalism, the game is positive sum. Yes. One word, positive sum, S-U-M. You win, I win too. We both could trade and both of us could win. Not that you win, I lose. Whereas Marxism, zero sum. You exploit, I lose. And constructivism, it depends. Because it depends on the culture, it changes. And the identity changes. And feminism, zero sum. The men win and women lose. Outlook, nine, eighth point. Outlook was a pessimistic outlook, realism. Liberalism, optimistic outlook. And uh, what about Marxism? Pessimistic outlook. Constructivism, optimistic outlook. Things evolve, progression. And in feminism, it's ambivalent you could say mostly pessimistic but it's ambivalent okay what about the last two okay last two intellectual precursors right the far left intellectual precursors the guys who came up with these ideas realism some names give me Machiavelli Hobbes Thucydides liberalism we, we discuss these names Hugo Grotius Thomas Aquinas Manuel Khan, you could even add Woodrow Wilson if you want. And in, under Marxist, Lenin, theory of imperialism, right? And of course, modern names, I, I gave you some Galtang, okay? Mohan Galtang. 
and what about anthropo <laughs> I did give it away constructivist the anthropologist Margaret Mead right John Miller you can write down this name John Miller okay and now solution solution the last one is what kind of solution to achieve peace in international relations the goal is to achieve peace and bipolar world that means only two powers like Soviet Union and the United States were a bipolar world multipolar means there are multiple powers strong powers at the time only two superpowers so that is the word realism sees it as better or balance of power remember I explained balance of power in under realism lecture for liberalism Kantian triangle the Kant's triangle the P at the middle peace yes. for Marxists it's revolution and redistribution so the bourgeoisie idea overthrows sorry uh, the proletariat overthrows the bourgeoisie here the periphery countries should overthrow the domination of the core countries okay so revolution and redistribution that means making everybody equal and for constructivists how do you get peace internalization of Kantian culture of anarchy basically getting Kant's idea that culture culture of Kant okay remember because it becomes friendly the identity becomes friendly every country creates the Kantian culture and it becomes peace how do you achieve peace in feminism? Empowerment, women's empowerment, okay? And equitable opportunity, or equitable opportunity means giving equal opportunity for women. Now, it's so about an hour of lecture in this, and I went and discussed all these theories. Read them, prepare them, and good luck. I'll see you in the next one.